very unusual looking office. When you walk in here and look at it, you're not sure what's going on in here. But there's a whole lot of health care that happens in this office. Uh, I'm proud to say this is the fifth clinic that I've owned and operated and been clinical director of. And, uh, and now my only clinic. When I'm not seeing patients, I'm usually doing interviews, uh, TV, radio interviews, talking about health care. Now, let me see a show of hands. Just how many of you are current patients in this clinic? Okay, so probably about half of you. Um, this, those of you that are patients know that this is a second career thing. Before being involved in healthcare, I worked in the engineering profession in nuclear engineering for the Department of Energy. And uh, I worked in a nuclear weapon production facility in South Carolina. And so I was trained uh, exclusively and detailed and nuclear processing the materials and so forth. And it was very, very complicated. I obtained a, a Q security clearance, which is the same thing as a top secret clearance, and had a lot of responsibility with that. But it was peanuts compared to the responsibility that I have when I work with each and every one of my patients. And so today's health talk is not going to be a health talk. It's going to be a talk about engineering. Because engineering explains what spinal stenosis is. And every one of you sitting in this room right now has spinal stenosis, whether you realize it or not. It's an inevitable part. It is a it is a law, just like a law of gravity that's holding you in your chair right now. And I'll explain more about what this physical law is that we study in depth in the engineering world and why these same laws in the engineering world also apply to you and your health. So we'll come full circle and make you understand all of this as we progress through. So today, this is what we're going to cover. I'm going to stay out of the way of our We're going to talk about number one, just how mechanical you are. Number two, I'm going to talk about those of you that had an injury, what caused that? Because just like I said, every one of you in here has spinal stenosis to some degree or another. Every one of you have the same cause or mechanism of injury. And I'm going to teach you what that is. And I'm going to talk to you about what your injury will cause in other parts, in other words, other health changes that occur in the body. Then I'm going to talk about what it takes to recover from an injury. And I'm going to use all kinds of visuals today. We're going to use these, this nail, two by fours. I'm going to use a garden hose. I'm going to use hula hoops. And I'm going to need some volunteers for the hula hoops to come up here and shake their hips. The fastest and the longest is the one I'm going to call on, so I'll find you. We're going to talk about how to maintain optimum health because your health is defined by two things. No matter, no matter if you are a surgeon, no matter if you're a neurologist, doesn't matter if you're a podiatrist. When you talk about health, we all study the same things, and it's biochemistry and biomechanics. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about biochemistry more at the end of the class and talking about this health topic about supplements and vitamins. The majority of the class we're going to talk about is this science of healthcare called joint biomechanics. Okay, so here's where we're going to go. Here's another. Here's another story that was recently in the news that points to the fact again that we are right in the middle of a health crisis in this country. Here we are in Los Angeles. A family of a Northern California girl made national headlines when she was declared brain dead after a tonsillectomy to correct sleep apnea. Sued the surgeon in the hospital on Tuesday, alleging medical malpractice. She passed away. She died. How many of these mistakes happen? What are the stats? What are the current stats? 7.5 million unnecessary medical and surgical procedures are performed each year in this country. Every year. 8.9 million people are hospitalized unnecessarily. And 784,000 people have iatrogenic means unintentionally caused by a doctor or medical treatment. Deaths occur each year. What would happen to the airline industry uh, if airlines killed 780,000 people a year, every year? What would they do to the airline industry? They shut it down. We have to re-examine how we manage health. 
and that responsibility lies on each and every one of you. So I applaud you for coming here and take the time out of your busy day to learn about your health. And I promise you, you're going to learn something about your health that you've not heard before. Because you're going to get it from an engineering perspective. Okay? Now, as I mentioned, I'm going to make a point to make you understand that you're a mechanical. And the most mechanical entity in the human body, of course, is the spinal column. The number two would be your feet. Extremely mechanical. So if we look at the spinal column, we have seven bones in the neck. There are 12 bones in the middle back, five bones in the low back, and then you've got a tailbone and a coccyx at the bottom. Every one of these joints, 24, that's the name of the clinic, Fix 24, movable ranges of motion. And when we start talking about range of motion, you cannot describe range of motion without talking about the word mechanics. Biomechanics is this. It's the study of mechanical laws and their application to living organisms, especially the human body and its locomotor system. The locomotor system is what allows you to walk from your car to here. It's what allows you to go from point A to point B. And something interesting that Thomas Edison said years ago, right? He said, the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame. If I stop right there, the human frame is you and biomechanics. In diet, biochemistry. Mm -hmm. The cause and prevention of disease. Well, biochemistry and biomechanics and a clear understanding of both of those and what you can do to manage those is the cause of prevention of disease. Okay. Now, this is all over the internet and, and my best knowledge is it was somewhere in the mid-2000s when this was published. Because sometimes people will ask me, well, you know, are you, are you appropriate to make a diagnosis? And I want to explain first of all, what does the word diagnosis mean? What does is, what is die mean? Two, right? And agnosis means what? We translate that from the Greek. It means don't know. Those two people that don't know. <laughs> what a diagnosis is. No kidding. Okay. So if we look at a breakdown in hours, pretty confident that chiropractic physicians get a significant amount of training. We look at anatomy and reality form in 56, doctor of chiropractic versus medical. This is a general practitioner. 243 in physiology versus 174, 296 in pathology versus 507. 161 in biochemistry, 100 microbiology, diagnosis, 408 hours in diagnosis to 103, 113. So the list goes on and on. I'm not saying that make you think that anybody walks in the water. I'm saying it because I want to lay the foundation that all of the knowledge that I'm going to regurgitate, even though this is great, really did come from that. It came to the in-depth principles and science of engineering. Okay. So what caused your injury? This is it. Every one of you who ever suffered a back problem, and what are the current stats of people with back problems? How many, how many people out of 10 in the U.S. have a back problem? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is 10 out of 10. You just don't know it. Okay? So I want to make sure you understand that. But trauma, two types of trauma, macro trauma and micro trauma. Micro means little things like an unguarded sneeze, bending over a tiny shoe, Macro trauma by car accidents, sports injuries. And then, of course, we're going to talk engineering because the second law of thermodynamics talks about this law of entropy. And most people have never heard of this, but I know there's some engineers in here. Right? So you're going to know where I'm coming from with this. So, here's some examples of micro trauma. Right? One would be, you know, when the male carries would carry a bag on one shoulder, or a female would carry a purse on the shoulder and weighs as much as a backpack in the middle there. Right? And then, you know, sleeping on the stomach with the head turned to one side all the time. 
and then talking on the phone the same year that we do these little repetitive habits, uh, chilling out on the couch like that, these are all signs of mechanical trauma. Little things that we do repetitive. You know, as we get older, what do we do? We get set in our ways. I'm sleeping on this side of the bed. I can't sleep on that side of the bed. Even, even when my wife and I go to a hotel, we get on our side of the bed, and I'm like, we got to sleep too much. And then this one, right? Leisurely activities like playing golf, playing tennis, using unilateral sports, where as hard as we can, we twist our body in one direction. In fact, that's what the interview up there is all about. Mechanical traumas. Yeah. And then we have things like macro trauma, which are the big things. Now, who in this room has never, ever, ever slipped or fallen or tripped or had a trauma? It's very, very rare. Usually the people that tell me, I, never, I can't remember having a trauma. Even when you were two, three years old, you come down a slide and you land right on your end. That's mechanical trauma. Okay. Now, the second law of thermodynamics is concerned with this word entropy, which is the measure of disorder. Okay. So, the second law explains that entropy of the universe always increases. That means that everything is tending towards disorder. What does that mean? Well, we know our tires can wear out. And why would they wear out faster on the front? And why would they wear out on a part of the tire, not the whole tire? Entropy. And then why does our toothbrush wear out? Except my kids, right? Their toothbrush doesn't wear out. <laughs> now you know that. <laughs> why, do, why do gears wear out? Right? Why do cars wear out that kind of look like my car in college right there? Why do your shoes wear out? Remember the day where you couldn't afford to go buy a brand new pair of shoes, just cut the toes out and walk a little bit more. Right? Now, is there anything, is there anything on this planet that does not degrade with time? Whether it's the chair you're sitting in, the pen you're riding with, or your hair, you know, or your house, your air conditioning unit, which you just replaced. Everything tends to, toward disorder. In engineering, we call it entropy. But what do we call that in human biology? The what process? The aging process. So, if I teach you how to slow down the aging process by manipulating and controlling this law of entropy, which you can, would that not benefit you? Because the end result of entropy, and every one of you with a mechanical spine, is the same result of the end entropy right there. We don't call that degenerative tire disease. <laughs> right? But yet, when this happens in your spine, we call it degenerative tire disease, or degenerative disc disease. It's not a disease. It's entropy. And why would you have one disc, or two discs look like that, and the rest of them look like that? Or why would you have arthritis in one joint of 24 bones in your back, or three joints, or one hip, but not the other? It's the same law because the tires are wearing on one side and not our way across. This is crucial information when it comes to making a decision what do you do about spinal stenosis? Your spinal degeneration, or what I call spinal entropy, Right? We have somebody who has a normal neck curve, and this is a picture of them looking like this with the neck going forward. And then we have a micro trauma because we're reading too much with the head and flexion. And then we start to strip the curve out, and then next thing you know, the curve reverses, and next thing you know, the discs start to degenerate, next thing you know, the bone's huge. You accelerated entropy, and you could have slowed it down. In other words, if I put four tires on a car, and the front end of that alignment, will they all age at the same pace? They will not. The ones that are suffering advanced entropy is the result of bad biomechanics or in the case of a car, a camera. And what's the cause? What's the cause in nearly 
just surpassed 7,000 patients. In 15 years, this is a second career. Every single case I have ever seen was brought into my office because of this right here. This is called flexion. So, when's the last time any of you had, those of you that weren't in patients, had a physical exam done by a physician? And why are we seeing physical exams go away? Men's Journal Magazine research published. It says, many orthopedists order MRIs because they feel compelled to offer something other than an old-fashioned physical exam. Because the MRIs detect tiny changes in tissue, scans often find abnormalities that aren't problems or even the source of an injury. For example, half of all middle-aged people with no shoulder pain have partially torn rotator cuff, which makes them all candidates for surgery. MRIs are overutilized. So, when we look at ranges of motion in a physical exam, this is called flexion. This is called extension. This is called rotation. And this is called lateral flexion. Same thing. Six ranges of motion. They're all your friend, except for one. It's flexion. And this is the problem in the US that I feel looking at you from an engineering perspective is that we do this all day long with our heads down. We bend over, get clothes out of the, the dryer, dish it out of the dishwasher. We sit on the commode. We exercise like this, which is horrible. We sleep like that in a fetal position with a knee drama. Right? This is a picture I took observing at a corporation where I did a corporate talk where they had specialists and ergonomists came in and told them to stretch that way to prevent back injuries. That is the cause of back injuries. It's the cause of spinal stenosis. And then we see, you know, when, when you get asked the question, how flexible are you in your mind, this is what most people will say. If I can bend over and touch my toes, I'm flexible. Rather than the measure of flexibility should be how far can I extend, right? All of these are four examples. And these are things that destroy your posture. But more importantly, this is the cause of spinal stenosis. Fact. Top of the x-ray there is called flexion. So that means that in this case, the person was bent over and they took an x-ray. So it's called a standing flexion x-ray. And then we see all the bones coming down, the square bones. And then at the bottom, what do we see? At the bottom, you have one bone, whereas this is the front and this is the back. And here we see a square bone that's gone way backwards. Whereas these guys are okay, and all the discs are okay, except for this one. There's no disc left. And all the discs are the same age, it has nothing to do with age. When we bend over, bones will move out of their position. Okay? And I'm going to explain that a little bit more. This is, if you own this picture here, this is a picture of spinal stenosis and a whole bunch of other so-called diseases that you're told you have that you don't have. What we have here are 24 bones that line up on top of one another. This is the front or the anterior. This is the back, which is the posterior. And when they're pushed from the back to the front, now I want to clarify that. Okay? Because this is not pushed from the back to the front. Twisting Spinal manipulation, and all of you that are patient, I know I am not a fan of that. Okay? We do no twisting, we do no spinal manipulation. We reposition bones. We reduce spinal stenosis, which is 100% of mechanical disorder. Because what happens in time? The majority of mechanical misalignments caused by us putting our body in flexion will cause these bones to shift backwards. And when they do, what happens to the opening right there compared to the opening here? When the bone goes back, that opening gets narrow and the nerve gets pinched. And the longer that bone is left out of alignment, it degrades or degenerates the disc. 
Just like the longer a front end is left out and on a car, it degrades and degenerates the tire tread. When the bone goes back and pinches that nerve and it's left in that position, the body will undergo changes. And these changes are called Wolf's Law, which means bone starts to remodel. And when a bone remodels because of a mechanical misalignment, you are left with bone spurs known as osteoarthritis. The cause of osteoarthritis, I will read directly from research that was published in Time Magazine, it had nothing to do with your age, if you have gray hair or none. <laughs> nothing to do with it. So this, if I was a radiologist looking at that, that diagnosis is called retrolisthesis. Retro means, of course, behind us. Listesis, mechanical misalignment, slippage, whatever you call it. There are rare cases where we have an instability or a fracture right there where the bone can go forward. Interestingly enough, all spinal stenosis surgeries are treated as if the bone went forward to compress the nerve. They do this thing called laminectomy, which I'm going to show you what that's all about. We're going to demonstrate a back surgery today with hula hoops. Okay. So you think Dr. Oz is good? <laughs> got nothing on me. Guard hose and hula hoops and these big edge clippers. We're going to do surgery today. This backward slippage is what every single patient comes into my clinic with. And my job is to find, because spinal stenosis is defined not as arthritic narrowing, it is simply defined as a narrowing of an opening. We studied stenosis in the engineering world. And it's no different when it comes to joint biomechanics. Who is the authority right down the road on healthcare? Mayo Clinic. Here's Mayo Clinic puts out his health letter on spinal stenosis. And this is what it says. Pain is often age-related. That's not age-related. I'm taking care of one-year-olds all the way up to 101 year old There's nothing to do with that. And then, then what do we do when there's a mechanical misalignment and I go to Mayo Clinic? This is, this is their treatment protocol. Number one is medications. We're going to give them Tylenol, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen. <coughs> Some studies have shown that certain antidepressants will help. This is right out Mayo Clinic do this. <coughs> antidepressants or spinal stenosis. And if that doesn't work, we're going to give you exercise and physical therapy. So I want you to strengthen your muscles up so we can solidify that mechanical misalignment. Physical therapy is important, but it has to be done in the right order. The first thing that has to be done is to make that narrow opening look like that and do that without twisting people's necks up. Because what's the number one fear as soon as they hear that word chiropractor. Yeah, taking the neck and going, it's up, right? I don't let anybody do that to me. And I advise you never let somebody twist your neck or your little back even. And then finally, the last one, when none of that works, we're gonna do steroid injections. And how many of you know, why are you only allowed to have a certain number of quarters on injections? Is it because that's all your insurance will cover or because it's half of this free cover? What hydrocortisone does? Hydrocortisone is a means of doing a chemical excision. In other words, it's a way of removing tissue without the need to cut it. It chemically literally dissolves tissue. This is very effective at removing spots of persistent pain. It makes the problem literally disappear. The problem is, while it removes the pain, it invariably leaves the structure weakened. Furthermore, whenever the fluid leaks, tissue is killed off. In this case, healthy tissue, including shock, absorbing fat, bristle, protective ligaments, were damaged, damaged, even disappeared. This was a case study that was published in a big pit where this woman got a cortisone shot before and after, three of them in her ankle. She had a pit that formed where the shot was given. Cortisone to chemically excess. Not a good option. 
So what is the option? Let's talk about this a little bit more. Here's a picture of a recent case that came in. Of course, this is the cervical spine, and then here's the front, and this is the back side. We should have seven bones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven bones. Now, what's the chaos going on right here? Do we see any of these discs in there? And there's none there. But yet, why would we have discs above? It's all the same age. This is a mechanic misalignment where the bone went backwards, compressed the nerve, and this patient was diagnosed with spinal stenosis of the cervical spine, producing migraine headaches. And I'll show you what else this will produce that you have no idea is related to nerve compression as we go through a little bit more. This is where your posture will suffer as bones move backwards. In the lower back, if a bone goes backwards, your center of gravity in engineering will begin to what? Fall forward. So people that have severe back pain, do they walk like this? Or do they walk like this? They walk in what range of motion? Flexion. Flexion is your enemy. And that's what this is. So what would we call that process as well? As we get older, is it normal for us to fall forward? It shouldn't be. Right? If we maintain our cars 50 years from now, you give them to your grandkids, they'll probably put them in Barrett Jackson and sell them for 10 times as much. Because the mechanical maintenance was applied that slowed down entropy in the automobile, which would be a, a huge investment. But it is no near the investment of all your health. So the question is, when that bone shifts backwards from doing too much flexion and it compresses the nerve, which is the result of spinal stenosis narrowing of an opening, and it doesn't matter, guys, okay? So it doesn't matter. You know, if this is 24 bones, right? If I had 24 hula hoops and I take one and mechanically misalign it, here's, here's, a, here's an axial view on an MRI that all of you got when you're diagnosed with stenosis. And all it takes is for me to be doing too much bending over and the bone starts to shift back. What happens to the inner diameter? Oh. Stenosis. This is mechanical. Okay? So, do you want to have surgery for that? We're going to go ahead and do some surgery here. Okay. Everybody follow me? Yes. Openings. There are three openings. The spinal canal, the nerve root on the left, and the nerve root on the right. Okay. I'm going to have you hold these guys like this. And this is what happens when the bones deviate backwards. Here's the front, this is the back, where the yellow nerves are. When the bone misaligns it from us bending forward in flexion, it goes backwards into the neurology, into the nerves. Now, if I try to look down that spinal canal, guess what? It's narrow. And so all these holes on the left and right side. So, when we do surgery, what do we do? We do this thing called spinal decompression surgery. Sign your life away. You want to take and shift one of these out of line and narrow that opening. So hold them just like that. Hold that one just like that. So there's the narrow opening, just like that. And when we do something called a laminectomy, which I'll show you where that is, it's about right here, right? I'm going to the same way. Go ahead. There we go. That's what happens when you have a laminectomy. It doesn't open this up anymore. Okay. And this is why I'll show you an x-ray of what that looks like. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. So what happens to those nerves? What do you think? Well, let's, let's see what the research says. 
to see what the medical profession said that conducted this research called the Winter Autopsies. And what they did was this. After graduating medical school, Dr. Winter was inspired to research. He wanted to know if there was a relationship between any disease organ discovered on an autopsy. That means these people were dead. And the birth were associated with the nerves that went to the organ that caused the death. Pretty straightforward. So the object of these necropsies or that session was to determine whether any connection existed between mechanical misalignments in the spine compressing the nerve, affecting the organ that caused the death. Straightforward. So the University of Pennsylvania funded this. And Dr. Winster carried out not one, not two, but three studies. And this is what he found. There is nearly a 100% correlation between minor mechanical misalignments in the mechanical spinal column and nerve compression that led to the cause of death. And here's just a few of them. When I spoke at a cardiology conference talking about cardiology function, why we have an epidemic of heart disease in this country. I spoke with three or four, it was four cardiologists that were brought in from Boston all over the United States. And this is up on our YouTube channel, Fix 24 by Dr. Michael Rob, where I spoke at this cardiology conference and I talked about all 20 cases of cadavers that died from heart and pericardial disease had a mechanical misalignment in the upper five thoracic vertebrae, spinal stenosis, nerve compression. They gave them, that resulted in not, what I don't call disease, but malfunction. Malfunction, heart. Pancreas, all three cases of pancreas disease had a mechanical misalignment in the mid thoracic. What disease process would that be? Diabetes. Exactly. Is there a correlation between spinal stenosis and the diabetic epidemic, which is now surpassing heart disease and the number one killer in the U.S.? I spoke at an anti-aging conference and explained all the biomechanical trauma that we had incurred that causes these bones to shift out of place, damage the nerve that control the output of beta cells which produce insulin in the pancreas. And now we have insulin and blood sugar problems. Lung disease, stomach disease, all nine cases of spinal misalignment and thoracic spine, T5, T9, die from a stomach disease. So it's known in the biomechanic world as the silent killer, the engineer. Dr. Clarence Johnson has developed a technique in chiropractic that we do in his office. It's called the silent killer because most people think that when you have a disease, it's a disease. You got a bad luck of the draw. But my point is this: every one of you that drove a car here today, that front end is out of alignment. Every one. And if you go to Pet Boys and you get the front end realigned, and they bring it down and give you your car back, as soon as you're driving that car out of the parking lot, guess what that front end is tending to do? I'm out of alignment. That is a law in physics called the law of entropy. And every one of you that has a mechanical spine, every one of you do, your bones are tending to come out of alignment. And which way are they going to move in 99% of cases? Backwards. And what brings that on? Then forward. That's why those, those, those of you that are patients of mine say, minimize bending over. Because in a 24 hour time frame, how much do you time? How much time do you spend with your head down versus an extension? How much time do you spend bent over versus an extension? That ratio is way off. And that's what's producing this epidemic of this mechanical problem of spinal stenosis. Case in point. Here's the first x ray on a patient. And this is the front, this is the back. Here's the lumbar one, lumbar two, lumbar three, lumbar four, lumbar five. This line drawn in the back of those square bones in radiology is called George's line. And George's line, when they either gonna line up or they don't. And if George's line is sitting back behind the, this line of the tailbone, that means the fifth lumbar is going to be diagnosed with spinal stenosis. And then, where does that fifth lumbar nerve root go? It goes directly into the large intestine. 
which explains why we had all this bloating and diverticulitis, Crohn's disease, IBS, with a 19-year-old female whose parents were both medical doctors. But we're out here. Took that bone without twisting it and pushed it forward, corrected the spinal stenosis, took another x-ray, drew this on here, and what happened to the IBS? It all went away. In fact, look at the distance between here and here, and look how much narrower this is. She wanted to go on a diet. There was no need to, because her stomach put bloating. The constipation went away. Her pain in the abdomen went away. And all these doctors would say, well, you, you, you know, don't eat gluten, don't eat this, you can eat that, you can eat this. Her problem was a mechanical problem. It was spinal snow. Why is that? Because the nervous system controls and coordinates all organs and structures in the human body, grazing and anatomy. Get knowledge of the spine, but this is the requisite for many diseases, Hippocrates. We are mechanical, and everything mechanical will misalign. And that's called the law of entropy. You know, when I say it, ten more times. Because every one of those little holes that get narrowed have a nerve that comes out and that goes somewhere. Okay? Come up here, more. One branch of the nerve goes into things that we feel or don't feel, like neuropathy. The other branch goes into controlling the function of organs. So what I want you to ask is how I need somebody to be a bladder. <laughs> and I need somebody to be a knee. Alright. Now, so we got a bladder and a knee. Right? Now, if I see that there's a common denominator here, and it's way back here, right? So this is the nerve, coming back, coming back, coming back, coming back, coming back, coming back, and it's attached to my brain. This is how it works. So the brain, through food, glucose, is a generator. It produces electricity. The electrical impulses travel down the spinal cord, out those openings on the left and right side of the spine, and they go to places in the body. When the, when the nerves exit out of those holes as one nerve, as soon as it gets past that hole, it branches into two. One branch is things that you feel, pain, that typically bring you into an office like this. The other branch goes into controlling the function of every single organ in your body. That's what the Winsor Autopsy study and it's what it proved. Because if we take this hose, and I take a mechanical misalignment, and I do this to it, what happens to those electrical impulses that get into the large intestine or the bladder? The incontinence. And then what happens to those electrical impulses traveling down to the feet, the tips of the toes? Numbness, neuropathy. Or if it hasn't advanced that far, pain. The common factor between an organ malfunctioning in your body and pain is where it comes out of that opening. And those openings are constantly tending to narrow because of flexion and trauma and entropy. Straightforward, guys. Thank you for being an organ. <laughs> All right. I thought they were going to get wet today. <laughs> Now, where do the nerves in the lower back go to? Men? Reproductive organs. So is erectile dysfunction really a disease? They got that name right. It is a dysfunction because of nerve compression in the lower back. Prostate enlargement is nerve compression in the lower back. Kidneys, the bladder, all from the lower back. Mid-back goes into the heart and lungs, stomach, digestion, all of this stuff. Up top, thyroid, sinuses, all of this stuff. And these these are not these are not out of some made up structure for somebody who's making these posters up. This is straight out of Gray's Anatomy. This is how your body functions. This is how your body works. Okay? So a mechanical problem here can produce symptoms here. And a mechanical problem here 
can produce symptoms here. And those mechanical problems are all in one of the same. It's called spinal stenosis. What's the number one cause of disability? Arthritis and rheumatism. Number two, back and spine problems. And it shouldn't say back and spine problems. It should say spinal stenosis. So where does arthritis come from? Time Magazine said, coming epidemic of arthritis, bad news research shows that it starts attacking your joints long before middle age. Long before middle age, you can get arthritis. So how do we prevent arthritis? That's the question. Here's a runner, right? Talking about the knee joint, because the knee's the largest joint in the body, a very common place to get arthritis. And this is what I said. Everybody can read this okay? <laughs> We're not having an eye exam today, right? It says, new studies show that runners are at no greater risk of arthritis as long as their joints are properly surgical procedure not. No. A line. People sitting in Dr. Rob's office have no greater risk of arthritis in your spine as long as your spinal joints are properly aligned. Is that any different than what that says right there? The cause of osteoarthritis is trauma to a joint. Shifts out of line. Wolf's law develops bone spurs to try and wall up that joint and take a joint that looks like this to this. It's an increase in pressure. <coughs> and we can slow that process down by maintaining good biomechanical alignment. And can that be done without twisting the neck off? The answer is yes. Should that be done without an x-ray? The answer is no. Should it be done, should spinal stenosis be diagnosed with an MRI? Should a flat tire be diagnosed when it's jacked up off the ground? No, it should be on the load. And if I had you lie flat on your back on this and I ran you through a tube to analyze you for mechanical alignment, Number one, an MRI should never intended to analyze or make a diagnosis or produce a diagnosis of spinal stenosis. It was designed to uncover pathology and soft tissue pathology on top of that. Okay. And too many times, surgical procedures are being told to patients that that's their only option after they did everything else on the Mayo list here. Okay. So is this the same person with a right knee and a left knee, yet we have a good lateral meniscus and a good medial meniscus and a good lateral meniscus, but one of the meniscus is not good. And so what is different about that x-ray, knowing what we just read in Time Magazine? Do those joints look like they're properly aligned? What is a classic sign of a hyperextended knee? is the distance between the tibia and the fibula. That gap right there would be normal. Over here, we see no gap. That's a mechanical misalignment that produced wear and tear on the inside of that tire tread. Mechanical misalignment. How do you know if you have a mechanical misalignment in your knee before you feel it? What will always be at any misalignment in the body? What will always be in any misalignment in the engineering world? Right? So in an engine, if I, if I have a, a piston that's not mic'd right, and the piston it creates a vibration, and the vibration creates a friction, and friction radiates heat. So an engineer is going to look at a car, and if he identifies that normal level of heat, then he knows he's got a mechanical problem. And guess what happens in the human body? Same thing. So if you take an ankle or a knee and you twist it out of alignment, it's going to swell. And what's it going to swell with? Inflammation. And guess what inflammation radiates? Heat. So this is why those your patients, we monitor you through the identification of heat and the reduction of heat, not just how you're feeling today. We can monitor the objective measurement of correcting spinal stenosis by repositioning the joint from a backwards position, stuck in flexion, by pushing it forward, and then teaching you how to extend an extension. 
That's what we're going to do today. So, those of you that are patients, and I went through your x rays with you, some of you come in with little problems, such as this knee, this nail. How many think you can take that nail with a hammer and drive it into one whack? What do you think? A little bit. How many whacks? Yeah, my brother's a carpenter. He could probably do that one whack. Me, it'd take me 15. Now, what if your problem was this nail? How many of you can drive that in with one whack? Maybe 10? What about this nail? What about that nail? And if I had one that was three times longer than this, that would be the average person that will come into the office because they have gone through this physical therapy, they've had 10 consultations, they've gone through pain management, they've gone through trying all of the biochemistry to try and fix a biomechanical problem. And this is why I'm writing a book on everything I'm talking to you about that will be published in October. And the name of that book is You Don't Need a Doctor, You Need a Good Mechanic. <laughs> because spinal stenosis is a mechanical problem, and it's affecting every one of you in this room, and everybody that you know. And it's not corrected by... Okay? Is there a problem that it's too far gone and you can't fix it? Good question. In other words, if all the tire tread is gone, can you fix it? And the answer is no. So if somebody comes in and they look like that versus that, that means that they put 400,000 miles on a car and never had the front end realigned because nobody told them you should realign your front end to preserve your tire tread. And most people have never heard a talk like this before. I've had nothing here to sell you today. No ideas, no vitamins. I have nothing to sell you other than to arm you with information that you must, must, must realize that you are mechanical. And if you manage your biochemistry, some of the stuff we're going to talk about, then, well, let me go back to that. Because this is one of the most important things that you can also learn to do today. Why do we have something called a lumbar support? in our cars. Why are, why are chairs designed with a lumbar support? Because it's designed to push your bones which direction? Forward. Right? So if I have that in my lower back and I have a bone that's gone backwards, this will prevent spinal stenosis. This will prevent spinal stenosis. This will prevent I don't expect anybody to have to get masturbation. But as close as you can. Because if the cause of stenosis is flexion, and we know that because we see it on x ray on flexion extension views, the prevention of stenosis is just the opposite of flexion. And what if everybody did this, extended more than they did flex? How would you age? How would you walk? And this is an epidemic. And we have doctors that are telling people, lean over on your golf cart or your grocery cart because your back's hurt. Okay? This is terrible advice. Yes? I have a question about the, the person on the wall. Should the legs, I was taught to, to have my knees bent. Yeah, I like to keep the knee bent down. And this is in the first book that I wrote that talked about all of these extension exercises. So, okay. the, in order to have extension, I should lean on the ball and have my knees. That's right. Right yeah. back. Because what happens here when there's a bone that's gone backwards? Gravity is pulling the body down and the ball is pushing the bone forward. And when the bones go forward, guess what happens to those openings? They increase diameter. What about the bridge? What's that? 
the bridge exercise. We'll, we'll talk more individually about exercise if you guys can get into that when we get through this. So here's my point. This is an x-ray taken of somebody who's bending over in flexion. And here's the same person that's in extension. This is the front of the spine. This is the back of the spine. These are the vertebrae. Now notice where the offset of this is. Notice where the L4 is shifted backwards here. Right into the spinal cord. Right into the peripheral nerves, causing spinal stenosis. The same person now extends and we take an x-ray. And look where the bone goes forward and opens the hole up, reduces spinal stenosis. Extension, it should be a part of your life. Flexion should be minimized because it's flexion that causes the epidemic of spinal stenosis. And what you didn't know is that your breathing and your blood pressure and your incontinence and your erectile dysfunction and your large prostate and your diabetes and all these other things can be traced back just as Hippocrates said, the origin of all disease lies in the spine. What was he talking about? He was talking about spinal, spinal, spinal mechanics and spinal stenosis <laughs> a long time ago as being a mechanical problem. Spinal decompression surgery, we demonstrated that. Where is the lamina? Right there. So they cut that right there and they take this and it's gone. And it leaves this open off the back. But what does it do to that point right there? Does it get the bone off the nerve? There's only one way to do that. That is to move the bone forward. And how do we do that? Slow and methodical. Not because if it was like this, a couple times you could go. Most people come in here with this nail, but they think their problem is this nail. And they say, why am I not better after 10 treatments? Or why do I have ups and downs? Because it's a process. To be honest with you, it is a process. Like putting braces on crooked teeth, it's a process. So, that's five deep compression surgery. We're gonna cut that, throw that away. What does it look like on that track? Here's somebody in the room here. Hope I'm not embarrassing you. See that big hole right there? That's where all the anatomy, the lamina, is missing because they cut it away trying to help this person with spinal stenosis. Did they even straighten the spine out before they did the surgery? No. And then there was pain in the right SI going, what do they do? They just put some bolts in there and screwed it that way. Folks, this is our bear. And I'm telling you this. Because of the background and training in nuclear engineering, this is absolutely barbaric. And this is when I put that story in the newspaper, and this office was flooded, I would say eight out of ten people came in for post surgical cases because these surgeries do not work. It's like having the front end out of line in your car, and I'm going to cut pieces of the front end away so that it, that misalignment adapts to the rest of your car. It is absolutely insane when this is a simple procedure of getting over the fear that somebody's going to twist you and to take a bone and drive it forward slowly but methodically until it's all the way in place. Does fix a flat really fix a flat? Or does it buy you more time? And that's what medications do, and that's what surgeries do for spinal stenosis. Because you can't and you never will be able to fix something mechanical with chemistry. Two distinct things. Speaking of biochemistry, I'm going to close with this. I want you to understand the process. We inherently bend over and look down. When we do that, structural misalignments are advanced and they go backwards. The nerves are behind the bones and the spinal cord are behind the bones. When those nerves shift out of place, when the bones shift out of place, they compress the nerves. When nerves are compressed, malfunction occurs and pain occurs and then ultimately neuropathy occurs. All of this brought on by mechanics. Okay. How is all of this reversed? Is to find the bone that's backwards, not on an MRI, but on a weight-bearing X-ray. And you take that bone and move it forward. 
to open those openings up. Is there a point of no return? The answer is yes to that. And that's why I encourage every one of you that are not a patient here and you want to see what this is all about, is to take advantage and get a spinal screening done because you'll never know. It's like you don't know if you have a cavity until you go to the dentist and he says, wow, you've been eating too much Halloween candy, right? Yeah. So most of the garbage started with Palmer. Palmer method or something? Yeah, the Palmer method is the name of the school of Palmer. There's over 200 different methods of chiropractic. The one that we do in this office, according to GonstedSeminar.com, there are three of us in the state of Arizona at this current time. There's 2,400 chiropractors. And I know some really good chiropractors. And I know some really bad ones. Okay. So I'm not here to bash the profession. I just know that there's a, there's a right way to do something and a wrong way. I don't agree with twisting, and I don't believe that any doctor or chiropractor really should touch the spine without a blueprint. Okay? But we'll talk more about that at the end. I want to explain this x-ray, guys. This is another x-ray. What is this right here? I mean, you would guess it's a kidney stone. Or a gallstone. What if I told you it was something else? Yeah, what if I told you those are pills? And what if I told you that's not medication? What if I told you that's vitamins? And what if I told you that those vitamins, because of all this bloating, is just sitting in the large intestine, which is ready to go right out the rectum? And that is two days worth of vitamins, by the way. Undigested vitamins. Right? What's that? Why haven't they dissolved? Right. This is the question. Why don't they dissolve? Because they have things like titanium dioxide, silicone dioxide. Right? Almost all of our vitamins that you can walk into a store and buy are now mass produced in China. And they have a lot of fillers in them that make them undigestible. Like the, like the women's and men's one a day, you cannot have a vitamin in one pill that's a one a day vitamin. It is physically impossible. And so what happens is you eat them and then they fall right in the toilet. And you get no biochemical advent from that whatsoever. I'm not here trying to sell supplements. It's not my thing. Okay? The only reason I have some supplements here that I give to patients because I see the need for it on film. But controlled supplements are important. Most of the food that we eat today are very depleted in nutrients. Okay? So you have to have a good multivitamin, you should have, you know, omegas, not just fish oil, but you should have all your omega 3, 6s and 9s on a daily basis, right? And if you have a disc that's degenerating, you have some type of carbon filtering supplement, right? The other thing is uh, monitoring your pH, your blood pH is very, very, very important. You know, cancer thrives in an acidic environment. I wrote, I've written articles, it's actually right up there, and there's an article in the bathroom about pH hanging on the wall. And I strategically put that there right next to the urinal so when you're going to the bathroom, you can read it. <laughs> Check your pH. Cancer, according to research that I've read online, can survive in a pH above 8.4%. 8.4 pH. That means the more alkaline you are, the more you can combat things like fungal infections, bacterial infections, viral infections, cancer, pH has a tremendous amount to do with that. And I advise you guys to talk for hours on pH. It's important. Get pH paper. Take the first urine in the morning, last urine of the night, do it for five days. Figure out where you are. If you're acidic, then go to Google and print out an alkaline food list and start eating things that are alkaline. Because the answer to the cancer epidemic is prevention not cure. Okay. The answer to the stenosis epidemic is prevention, not cure. Right? We don't wait until our engine blows up and say, I need to change the oil. And I encourage you to find a good mechanic. And I'm an okay doctor, but I'm a really good mechanic. And that's what the majority of you need.